My name is Jacob Perry. Um, I'm a software engineer at Divi. Divi is a fintech company. It's uh, HQ is in Utah, uh, but we're kind of all over the place. Um, something special about me is that when I came onto Divi, uh, is when I wrote my first line of Elixir code, like the majority of the people uh, on the Divi team, actually. Um, so, in summary, what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, in the next little bit, uh, is if you can't really find any Elixir engineers, you might as well just make them, because uh, it's easier to make them than find them. Uh, experts in Elixir aren't really needed to grow and have an amazing Elixir team uh, and build a great product. Uh, I think uh, over the course of all of the hiring and, and crazy growth that we've done, the vast majority of people uh, have never even heard of Elixir before. Uh, the complexity of Elixir, at least at, at the beginning, is not needed. You, uh, as you dive into Elixir and learn more about it, I highly recommend that you do, do learn more about uh, the advanced things like OTP and GenStage and, and uh, these powerful features. But to get off the ground running and be running really fast and really well, uh, you, you don't need them at first. So, I mean, this is the main summary. Uh, now you know you can leave if you want, uh, otherwise I'm going to keep talking. Uh, in the beginning for Divi, we, Divi was founded about three years ago in 2016, uh, and we started with Elixir from the very beginning. I think that's kind of an interesting use case because uh, from everyone that I've talked to, most people are currently porting their system over into, into Elixir or uh, are just dabbling with it. They might have a small section. In, of their uh, system in Elixir, but for the most part, it's running something else. And we had a, we started with a really small group of engineers. Why we chose Elixir from the beginning is, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, the, the CTO at the time uh, was familiar with Elixir, and he, he chose it for great reasons. One of our senior software engineers, Clinton, wrote a great post about this, and it talks about the fault tolerancy of Elixir, the scalability, the concurrency, all the things which are really great for us as a company for Divi because we're working with people's money and things need to be running really well all the time. And Elix that Elixir really lends its hand really quite well to this use case. So fast forward another year and a half, a couple years later, uh, April 2018, that's when I joined the team. And that's when I first started writing my first Elixir. Uh, the teams were still pretty small at the time. We hadn't started. We had just barely started our huge uh, hiring phase and our, our growth and expansion. So, and at that time, uh, we had a small group of back-end engineers working in Elixir. Fast forward another year and a half to now, August of this year, uh, we've grown the team. It's, it's grown somewhere between eight and 10x in, uh, in about a year. Uh, in one year, it's about 8x. Since I came on, it's even more than that. The teams are, are they're bigger, they're, there's way more of them. We're working in a great, amazing code base, uh, touching a lot of the same code, but we're able to create a lot of great, really great features with minimal bugs, even though we're all working together on the same thing. So this is kind of the hiring phase over the last year and a half that, uh, well, two years that we've uh, experienced. And for the first while, up until about April, of 2018, if you can see that, the team was about the same size, but then oof, we took off like a rocket. Um, how and, and why are really great questions for this. Uh, the why is that Divi is in a really great niche fintech uh, marketplace, and in finance, businesses tend to be really sticky. Once you have this company that's doing something really well and clients like it, it's really hard to 
to break into that space and find new clients is clients because for the most part, they're happy with where they are. It's like, it's working. I'm just gonna keep things how they are. And uh, we, the other part of the why is that in order to do this, we knew that because things are sticky, we needed to get, have a really amazing product. We needed to grow really fast and be able to crank out these features that our clients wanted as fast as they could. So in a, set, in a sense, we could get there before anyone else so that we could find people who, who realize, oh, this is such a great product, and then deliver the things that they wanted, and they'd never want to leave us. And the how of that is, I don't know if you've heard of Divi in the News, but we've been raising some really large amounts of venture capital funding in order to, to really just fund this huge expansion in our engineering so that we can move as fast as we can, as, as we could, and as we wanted. To do this uh, with Divi as a whole, we had to set some reasonable expectations. We knew as an engineering team that five years experience for an Elixir engineer is just not really realistic. I think there are a few uh, that have that, but they are really far and few in between. Uh, we, just, we knew that we would end up hiring uh, grunts or versus pros or experts. And I'm not meaning anything derogatory by grunts, but we just needed people who'd be really capable of learning a new language and uh, cranking out really good code really fast. So more like a, like a machine or a factory instead of uh, waiting and hiring for the, the specific person who knew the ins and outs of everything. We had to get stakeholder buy-in with the, the leadership of the company. And uh, this was interesting because we had a, a really great uh, technology that we were wanting to use, Elixir, and uh, especially for the leadership of the company, they had never heard of most programming languages before, uh, but especially not Elixir. So we had to let them know that we were going to be using this technology that was more obscure, but had really good reasons for why we wanted to use it. We, we thought that feature development would probably slow down, because with uh, hiring new developers, who had never, most likely never used Elixir before, it would take a lot of time for them to ramp up and uh, get to a level where they can be proficient and really productive in Elixir. These last two points uh, proved to be really false. We didn't really need to set those expectations because they, it, it turned out not to be true. Our feature development, it was like, the slowdown was like a blip on the radar. Uh, for the most part, when we brought on new engineers, uh, they were pushing code out to production in about two weeks. Um, and I think that lends a huge hand uh, to uh, Elixir and the, and the fact that it's such a, a friendly uh, language to, to be able to pick up and, and learn and be productive with. So when we were trying to find people, um, there's really... Uh, it's, there's some really interesting statistics. This is from the 2019 Stack Overflow uh, Most Popular Technology Survey, Developer Survey, and Elixir is way down at the very bottom. Uh, according to all respondents, about 1.4% of all people had either used Elixir or had heard of Elixir, um, which is, is not a lot, especially where you're trying to build an entire team as fast as you can and move forward with that quickly. On the flip side, uh, where it's the most loved, on the most loved list, Elixir ranks quite high. So we basically figured, well, if people don't know Elixir, we can't find them. Let's just make some Elixir developers because they're going to like working in Elixir anyways. So in finding people, I think we, we've hired dozens of people over the last uh, year for our engineering team. And we've hired roughly five people who came to Divi because they were looking for a company who was using Elixir in the first place. Most everyone else was meh or agnostic about Elixir. A lot of them had never even heard it before. To be honest, I had never heard of Elixir before I interviewed with uh, our CTO. Um, and at least one of our engineers absolutely hated Elixir when he, he started. Uh, luckily, he worked in the front end for the most part. But he, uh, he, he just, 
he didn't see the light at first. So there was really two sides of our growing the team. The first was hiring, and the second was training. So with hiring, we realized really quickly and right off the bat that what people knew coming in about Elixir mattered very little, because most likely they knew nothing at all. Uh, so what we really looked for was more culture, team fit, and capability for these engineers, that they had a solid uh, foundation under them in design principles that they were able to learn and wanted to learn new things really quickly and that they would be able to be up to snuff and be productive as fast as they could. We gave out a pretty judicious tech assessment, and there's a little controversy with this just because what we would do is we'd give out a, it's kind of a project, we'd say, hey, we want you to build a budgeting app. And here's our tech stack, which we use React on the front and then Elixir for the back, uh, back end and uh, Postgres for the database and everything. Go build something for us and show us what you can do. And for the most part, it worked really well because it allowed us to see where people uh, would most likely fit in. If they focused mainly on the front and in the React code, then we knew that they'd be a really good fit for our front end team. But if they spent more of their focus on, in the back end Elixir, we knew that they would be a really good candidate. And, but this was rough because most of the time people spent way too much time on this tech assessment. I think when I did this, I spent probably about 20 hours working for this interview, doing this tech assessment, which uh, it worked out really well for me. I don't regret it at all, but we have had a couple of people who have said, hey, this tech, this tech assessment is taking way too long, uh, and we've been really mindful of that. If they're having family things coming on or not able to have enough time, that's fine, but if they realize, like, hey, this is too much time, I don't want to do this, we were like, well, that's great, thank you, you don't have to work at Divi either. So, um, I'd like you to meet Daniel. Dan Daniel is a, a really good candidate that uh, we, hi we hired from this uh, tech assessment and this hiring process that we had. Uh, he gave me permission to do this, so as I drag him through the mud, uh, he, he knew full well what uh, was gonna happen. Uh, he's, and he's actually great. He, he came on and he spent the most of the time working on, in the front end React code. And that's where we ended up placing him uh, was working uh, in our, our web app. And it worked great, but Daniel, like culturally, uh, for the team fit, everything, he, he was a knockout. He, he's a great engineer, and we really enjoy having him. But at first, uh, he's the one who actually hated Elixir uh, when we hired him on. He, we'd have conversation, and he'd say things like, you know, Elixir, just, it just feels like it's gonna fade out. There's this, it's just a fad language. Uh, it's, it scratches certain itches with like a flamethrower. Um, on top of that, Elixir built on the dinosaur that is Erlang. Um, the homepage proudly touts the VM's reputation of being low latency, distributed, and fault tolerant, as if these aren't basic features implemented in ver virtually every other respectful language. I know, fighting words, right? Uh, and bottom line is Elixir is an interesting experiment in enforcing functional programming, but it throws the baby out with the bathwater. So he, uh, he stayed on a front end for a while. Uh, and then on the flip side of the hiring, we had training. Uh, and probably the most important thing we, that we did at first were, was that we enforced code conventions. We used the, the tools like Credo, the, these static code analysis tools, uh, in our CI pipelines, Credo, to make sure that we're, our, our formatting and, and the things are looking good. A dialyzer to tell us where things are broken and helping us find dead code or fix bugs before they showed up. The Elixir formatter just so that everything that everyone is looking at is the exact same, because when you're bringing on uh, dozens and dozens of new engineers, no one has time to try and siphon through and learn everyone else's coding style. And documentation, uh, we made that required for every code, every line of code that people were writing, every function. And the great thing about all these is that we were able to enforce them with linting in our CI pipelines to fail if they didn't do anything, if they didn't implement them how we wanted. And the documentation is great because there's that famous quote that Jose talks about with GenStage where um, when they were writing GenStage, it took 1,000 lines of code, but they had 1,100 lines of documentation to go along with it. And so we've really adapted that and taken that to heart. We've had formal-ish trainings 
with our new employees as they've come on. We've had our senior engineers who've been working in Elixir for a while, teaching like a 10, Elixir 101 class once a week, and people are able to show up for our QA engineers or the, the new engineers who've been come on, and they're able to go through and just learn as much as they can. Or uh, they've had we've had classes where uh, I've taught things on Absinthe and GraphQL, since that's another technology that most people uh, haven't really had a lot of experience with. And, and how to use that in Elixir. Um, and then we've had code reviews, uh, really strict code reviews. And really, code reviews are probably the king out of all the things that we've done uh, for really good reasons. The first is because we are a, a fairly remote team. We have a lot of people who work in the, in the office, uh, but we have a lot of people who are working remote. And a code review provides a really nice avenue to receive feedback and see other people's code as well. Because as you are learning and learning a new language, it's really hard to envision new ways that you could do something. And by sitting down and having someone go through and be like, hey, you could actually do this, and it would be better. Or seeing someone else doing something, it's like, oh, I've never seen that before. I think I'm going to try, try that out next time. There was a, an unexpected benefit of building a team in Elixir, because it really produced an unexpectedly humble and no ego team. Because as we were bringing on all these engineers, we were hiring senior engineers who had years and years of experience, uh, yet they were receiving code reviews and sitting down with people who had been working in Elixir for a year, but uh, were maybe fresh out of a code camp a year earlier. And it really just allowed a great culture across the board that uh, code reviews were not scary, were not menacing. They're meant there to be productive and allow just you to ship a better product. And by implementing the, the code conventions and things above, it really just allowed you to focus on what was important, which was the, the logic and the features that were, were being shipped. Um, and then with our trainings, there was always a baptism by fire. Any time that we brought someone new on, they were always 100% of the time placed on a really high priority project because we have no low priority projects. Everything is important. We're trying to get everything done as, we, as fast as we can as, with as high quality as we, can, we could. Uh, and I remember when I first came on, my first baptism by fire, we like to affectionately call it the TXP2, which is a, our transaction processor. I mean, we're a, we're a credit card company. We're processing transactions. We're coming in. And we had to swap that out and, and modify that. And it's, it's pretty much akin to driving down the freeway and trying to replace your engine at the same time and have nothing, absolutely nothing go wrong. And it was, it was, it was a baptism by fire. It was a great time. We, we think back and we laugh at it, hoping it will never happen again. Um, we have certainly experienced some growing pains with growing our team as fast and as large as we have. Um, Probably uh, one of the main ones we've experienced is that Elixir uh, is still, even though it's maturing a lot, it's still a, a growing and evolving ecosystem. Things are changing about it all the time, uh, not just with Elixir itself, but also with the, uh, the libraries that we use every day. Um, uh, for example, uh, I call this day Pi Day, uh, which is March 14th. I released some code to production, which it, Produced probably my biggest bug to date, um, and it had to do with the Ecto library. I had been tasked with upgrading Ecto from 2.2 to Ecto 3. And for the most part, it, it was great. It was really nice. It was plug and play, um, except there was this one place with Ecto in the upgrade that they had changed, and they, they unified across the board how they handled date times. And with Ecto 2, if you created a date time and then you gave it to an Ecto change set, uh, the change set would mirror that date time completely. But with Ecto 3, uh, if you said that the date was like uh, a date time USEC uh, or something, it would add on the extra zeros to get to that, that precision. Um, so it, in this case, you could see it added on four zeros, so it'd be at the microsecond precision. I didn't realize this at the time, but we were using a date time field along with three other fields and hashing them together to create kind of a unique ID. And with those added zeros, it 
uh, created brand new unique IDs across the board. And so it resulted in a lot of duplicate things uh, from something that is relatively minor. So um, it's small changes like that that uh, might not exist in more existing and mature languages. Um, with deployments, uh, and this is stepping away from Elixir in general, but with deployments as a whole, uh, it's been really unique, a uh, really unique challenge because we've had to go through different phases of trying to figure out how to increase our deployment speed without everyone feeling like they're stepping on each, other, each other's toes and feeling like they needed to do regression testing on the whole system instead of just their specific part of their app that they're working on. Uh, so for example, this is in, in January of this year, and we made some organization changes on our engineering team, and uh, we were able to just skyrocket the number of deploys from uh, the tens to several hundred a month, which is great. Because even if you're shipping out small uh, CR, MRs at the time and, and going through and doing small deployments, that's better than doing huge big ones anyways. Um, and a, perhaps a general lack of Elixir, Elixir experience as well. Uh, another thing that I worked on uh, was uh, our background jobs. And we were using Quantum for, that, for this at the time. And I want to stress that Quantum is a perfectly fine library. It is great and it works really well. But, uh, it, and it's a library that you can use in, in uh, Elixir to schedule background job, cron jobs, essentially. And uh, we were experiencing a known use case that Elixir had documented, uh, that Quantum had documented on their GitHub repo uh, because we were using Kubernetes in production as well and scaling with the number of deploys that uh, we were going through and deploying. Um, Quantum was crashing and causing all of our nodes to, to come crashing down around our ears and having a really unstable, shaky, last remaining node in production. And it was really stressful. It was stressing our DevOps team out. It was stressing a lot of us out. And we, we couldn't really figure it out at the time. Um, I know the, the fault tolerancy thing of Elixir and the Elixir-y thing to do is just let it crash. Um, but us letting it crash was not a good option because it was crashing the whole system. And we weren't sure why. Uh, it was taking everything down. So there were things that we could have done. Uh, I could have uh, converted them all into generic gen servers and had them running, but then we run into the same problem of every time we deployed uh, and did a new deploy, it, it would kill the gen server anyways and then just start it up over again. Um, so ultimately what we did is we converted all of our background jobs into mixed tasks and then we use Kubernetes and the Kubernetes cron job scheduler to just spin up a new container, run the mix task that would run our background job at the time we wanted, and then it would spin it down. And perhaps there were better, more elixir ways that that could have been happened, but it's actually how we have things running now in production using Kubernetes, and it's running really well, running great. So measuring success and growing our team, I think, uh, is always an ongoing process. It should always be an ongoing process. Uh, because as things change, uh, standards change, as you hire new people, you're hopefully hiring higher and higher ca caliber people that can help raise the bar at your team. So the standards should change and, and raise the bar as well. As you, the engineers gain better understanding of how things work in Elixir and systems in general, that uh, that understanding should bring, bring adaptation to your system so that you're constantly adapting your system to work better and utilize the tools in a better way. Rapid development and deployment, I think, is a huge measure of success. Our SVP of engineering, Greg Larson, uh, he, he, would, he would challenge us to gamify the system as much as we could, because he's like, well, small deployments all the time is way better than having a massive deployment anyways. And ultimately, we engineers as a whole, if you can spend less time firefighting bugs and writing new features, I think that is probably a, a huge measure of success, which we were able to see. This, the light blue line is actually the measure of our bugs over time that we were introduced, new bugs over time that we were introducing. And even as we were uh, skyrocket, skyrocketing our deploys, the number of new bugs that we were introducing was actually going down. And I think a big part of that was uh, the fact that we were using Elixir 
in ga getting uh, better at it. Uh, engineering happiness over time, and even at the very beginning, has just been uh, through the roof. Uh, Elixir is really unique in that because it's still a, a young and, and maturing language, that there is a really great opportunity to contribute to the ecosystem. That, uh, and we've had several engineers, um, like Nathan, uh, who has contributed to Absinthe, which is the GraphQL toolkit for Elixir. Uh, we've had Sean, who has uh, contributed to the Mox library. And uh, I got to give this guy a little grief, because he couldn't even spell Platformatech right. <laughs> so I fixed that for him, making him look good. Um, Everyone on our team wants to cross-discipline into Elixir. This is something really interesting we found, uh, especially with our front-end engineers. They experience some serious FOMO. Uh, they are always trying to like, hey, let me dive in there and start learning more Elixir. And we're happy to let them, uh, which is great. Um, and just in general, that programming in Elixir is really fun. Uh, so let's talk about Daniel again. Uh, he, com he's, he completely changed his mind. Uh, he's still saying that he's trying to decide if he was held captive by, by Elixir, and now he, he's just fallen in love with it with Stockholm Syndrome. Um, that pattern matching is the, the real hidden gem of Elixir that he can't get enough of. Uh, he misses being able to Google things for most languages like Python or Java, where you can just find the, question, the answer to any question you can think of. But he really appreciates what Elixir brings to the table. Um, that it's now the tool that he likes to reach for instead of uh, his beloved PHP. And uh, overall, Elixir has really just proven him wrong. And he's actually now one of our most prolific Elixir engineers. So we've converted him. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, so in summary, like I said before, if you can't find your Elixir engineers, you might as well make them because uh, they're going to be great. If you find the right people who are able to learn the new language, they'll pick it up and they'll be uh, really quality and just help you grow and deliver an excellent product. That you don't need experts. You don't need the complexity of everything right off the bat uh, because just in general, the, the ecosystem as a whole can let you uh, go really far without needing to introduce some of those things. And that you shouldn't wait to grow your team if you're trying to hold out for senior engineers those that have five, five plus years experience, because in Elixir, you're not going to find it. Rarely, you're not going to find it. Thank you.